We'll be talking about automating cloud native Spark jobs with Argo workflows today. Thanks for coming. Um, so yeah, quick agenda. Uh, we'll be doing an intro, just talking about the goals for the talk. We'll cover some background about the tools we'll be addressing today and using. Um, talk about a few common problems with Spark that we've run into um, and how we've solved them with Kubernetes and Argo workflows. Um, we also have a demo for you. Um, plans to be live, live demo. So we'll show you how that runs um, and share a repo with you. And then we'll talk about some next steps and leave time for questions. So our intros, um, yeah, today we want to learn about scaling and stability advantages of using Spark on Kubernetes. Um, so we'll cover that. We'll also cover how to use Argo workflows to automate and orchestrate um, Spark jobs as well as jobs um, that you might run with different compute frameworks like Dask or Ray as well, um, doing that on Kubernetes. And then we'll learn about what else is possible. You know, now that you've deployed um, your Spark app onto Kubernetes, what can you do next? We'll talk about that. A little quick about us. I'm Kalen, the co-founder and CEO of Pipekit. Um, at Pipekit, we use Argo workflows to scale data pipelines for enterprises. Um, and that's essentially we run um, for companies that like to use Spark. We help them get Spark jobs running on Kubernetes um, and as well as other compute frameworks and help them build fully featured data science platforms um, that are more reliable um, and help them move faster. So if you're interested in managed Argo workflows, that's what we do. Um, we've worked with numerous companies that use Spark, so that's why we're talking about some of the issues we've ran into and how we've solved them. Um, and then I'm also a contributor on the Argo workflows project, so you'll see me in the community answering questions, community uh, meetings, um, and in general helping with the Argo workflows roadmap. Um, and I'm fortunate today to be with my talented teammate, Darko. Uh, hello, so my name is Darko and I'm senior software engineer at Pipekit. I am from Serbia and I'm mostly working with uh, distributed systems, cloud infrastructure and Kubernetes. Thank you. All right, so now let's cover some background, make sure we're all familiar with these three tools. So how many folks here are using Spark already? A couple. Awesome. <laughs> Great. Yeah, well, um, a little bit about Spark then. So it's actually the most popular um, data compute framework um, currently. Um, so in the past, you might have used Hadoop. Um, it's the next generation of that. And then um, it's a generation before some newer frameworks like Dask and Ray. Um, but still, it's the most popular because it's so versatile. So it's kind of the one-stop shop for data science. Um, you can run batch jobs, um, parallelize jobs really, and get them done faster. You can also use a streaming framework that Spark has as well um, that really complements doing batch jobs alongside streaming. And then there's a whole machine learning suite as well that you can use as part of Spark. Um, you can use almost any common language that you would use for data science, which is handy. Um, so that's why we see a lot of people wanting to use Spark um, and, and as, that, as their first step. Um, However, there are some issues, um, especially deploying Spark on the traditional deployment using Yarn um, on a Hadoop. Um, and these make doing data engineering pretty frustrating. Um, so doing things like managing just dependencies, different libraries on the same distribution is really difficult. Um, figuring out how do you run experiments between environments or hand off an experiment to a teammate. Um, you know, if I want to use different compute configurations on the same cluster, that is actually pretty challenging. And this is because um, Spark on Yarn actually requires you to do global installs of the version. Um, so you, you're pretty locked into a single version for your cluster. It's not supporting Docker natively. So that makes it really, uh, you have to do some extra work to use containers and run your jobs um, with containerization. Um, and then that also means like debugging any issues you run into is a little bit harder. Um, and then the actual deployment consumes more resources at baseline than if you were to deploy on Kubernetes. So um, if you're really deploy, um, deploying a lot of Spark jobs um, on, a, on a given cluster, this does add up when you're, when you're actually not running your compute. And then finally, there's no auto scaling capabilities like you have with Kubernetes. So if you want to vertically scale up um, to a GPU or add more CPU, um, this is a lot, tr lot harder on the traditional deployment. Um, so fortunately, we're going to talk about Kubernetes today. Um, so is anyone using Kubernetes currently at work? OK, 
good. Okay. <laughs> yeah, it's becoming more popular, which is great. And how about for data use cases? Okay, a couple. Cool. So today we'll be focusing on yeah using Kubernetes for data science applications. Um, and really the benefits that we see with that are around, number one, containerization. So when you start to adopt containers as the building block for each step in your pipeline, you see two big benefits. Um, number one being your data pipeline is more re reproducible. So you can hand off portions or the whole da data pipeline to a teammate um, for them to rerun or to iterate off of. Um, they don't have to you know, fully reproduce your local environment. Everything's containerized. And if you have a container registry set up, they can just pull down their Docker images for any step in the pipeline and rerun it. Um, so this helps a team move a lot faster um, given there's a lot less overhead to reproduce any portion of your data pipeline. And then reliability-wise, you, you receive a lot of benefit from having all your dependencies managed in a given container. Um, you can move easily between versions of Spark or any sort of other um, compute framework you're, you're using um, and deploy that to production and, and know with confidence that, OK, if this worked you know, in dev, we'll get it to prod. Um, the number two biggest thing is um, benefit of moving to Kubernetes for data science is a declarative approach. So we can focus less on how are we going to scale our compute and more define what are the parameters in which we want to scale within, and Kubernetes will handle the rest for you. Um, so we'll get into that a little bit later today, but that really changes things um, and makes the data engineering side a little bit more predictable and easier to deal with. A good example of that is vertical auto scaling. Um, so this is a key feature of Kubernetes that we'll be talking about today. Um, so in the, in the event that you have a, a job that's very high in usage, um, you know, you get a big data dump in um, every so often, maybe it's only once a week or once a month, um, you can define parameters that um, will scale up the compute and even scale down the cluster to zero um, if, when, you, when you're not running that job. And then the final big benefit of Kubernetes is what you get in addition um, to just the data applications. You also get a bunch of other things um, in the ecosystem that are built on top of the Kubernetes API and let you integrate easily with um, CI CD tooling or observability tooling if you want to add that for a more production ready data pipeline. Um, so, yeah, a quick glimpse of our architecture. Sorry if this is a little small. Um, but this is how we. We uh, deploy Spark on Kubernetes. We're essentially using the Kubernetes master as the scheduler instead of the old traditional approach of relying completely on Spark. Um, so Kubernetes will spin up a driver pod. Um, it'll talk to that driver pod. And when there's a request for an executor, um, Kubernetes will then say, OK, I will spin up executor pods for you. Um, it then tells the driver pod those pods are ready. And the driver pod um, will communicate and um, shard the jobs and spin up the, the executions. And then, of course, once that's all done, Kubernetes knows, OK, the job was successful. Um, we'll spin all of this down. And that way, you don't have to keep it live. Now, getting into Argo Workflows. So Argo Workflows is a DAG orchestrator, um, a workflow engine. Um, and it's the best way to run workloads on Kubernetes because it's built for Kubernetes. So the deployment is very straightforward. There's only a couple of dependencies that need to be deployed. Um, and it's very generalizable. So um, you can use it for just about anything on Kubernetes. You know, ETL um, is really popular to use. You can spin up training jobs. Um, you can orchestrate deployments. And then you can do you know, traditional DevOps and CI CD workloads with Argo workflows as well. Um, so that's a big benefit. And that's why the community has grown a lot lately. Um, so over uh, just about 12,000 stars on GitHub. Um, and you'll find a variety of people on in the community using it for any of these reasons or a combination thereof. Um, Argo Workflows uses YAML as the definition. And then it also has a Python SDK as well. So you can define workflows with Python, which is really handy for us data folk. Um, and I think the, the biggest takeaway with Argo Workflows is once you've declared your DAGs in your pipelines, there's um, also ways to um, trigger those jobs in a way that, you know, just besides manual, which we'll do today, but you can use Git to trigger jobs. You can do cron jobs. Um, and you can also do event-based triggering. Um, and so this really just opens up the possibility to do um, real-time workflow um, orchestration and do it all on Kubernetes. All right. I'll hand it over to you. Thanks. 
So yeah, now I'm going to show you our architectural diagram and how we connected everything with Argo. So yeah, at the beginning you simply need to submit a new workflow to the Argo and after that Argo will schedule a new workflow using Kubernetes master and specifically Kubernetes API and then the scheduler will bring up a new workflow. After that uh, our new workflow will submit a new Spark job and will start monitoring for the state. And after that uh, Kubernetes master will bring up the driver pod for the Spark and then uh, Spark will request um, the executor pods and then we will get uh, our new executor pods ins our inside our cluster and yeah then Spark will schedule all the tasks on the executors and in the meantime Argo workflow will constantly monitor the state and when the execution is done uh, we will get the result so yeah it can be a fail job or can be a successful job uh, so we already saw how you can well from our diagram how you can schedule um, spark job using Argo and Kubernetes so one of the biggest benefits is uh, you can use the different spark versions inside your same cluster because you're well you're using containers so everything is contained inside your uh, container images and you do not need to manage any dependencies or install anything uh, and by using that you are also well you do not need to download any dependencies at the runtime so you can run everything really fast and this also allows you to standardize your environment so uh, you can use the same configuration on your local machine and in the cloud. Also, this also provides you, uh, well, you will use a lower resource because you do not need to install anything inside Kubernetes and because you're using Kubernetes, you can auto scale easily. Uh, and then you can also use other frameworks uh, besides uh, Spark, so you can create uh, and use similar architecture for other frameworks like Desk or Ray, and you can extend all your toolings. And uh, at the end, since uh, you're running everything in container and in and using Kubernetes, you can add uh, some kind of a log aggregator. You can provide metrics and monitor everything really easily. And you can also extend your CI CD pipeline so you can bring everything inside Argo and Kubernetes and you can cover your entire process from the moment you are building your images and submitting changes to the Git to the moment uh, when you're running tests and running the actual workload. And uh, this also allows you to easily move from uh, one cloud vendor to the other because you're using Kubernetes and not, not the actual Spark service from the cloud provider. And yeah, so now I'm going to show you a little sm small demo that we prepared. So we're going to create a small Spark job that analyzes the Kaggle dataset. So this data, data set contains some bike share ride and we are going to analyze this data set and find the uh, how much is each bike type used and we are going to find out uh, how long is each bike type uh, ridden and yeah bike type can be uh, electric bike regular bike so yeah that's our spark job and after that we are going to show you how argo manifests argo workflow manifest looks like and how are we executing that on Kubernetes and at the end we are going to simplify our Argo workflow manifest by using workflow templates so yeah I'm running everything on local using local Kubernetes cluster we already have installed Spark operator and Argo workflows and we already have pre-built uh, images for our jobs so yeah can we go like this okay We'll just pull up the live demo. Okay. So yeah. Uh, okay. So yeah. 
here's our uh, spark job written in Scala and yeah here you can see how it looks like so basically we are loading everything from our data set and simply calculating the occurrence of our bike type and at the end we are simply printing everything up and yeah and this is how our Argo workflow manifest looks like and it's really easy to write one so at the beginning you need to define a name for your workflow and you need to specify your DAG uh, tasks so the jobs that you want to run so here we have two jobs one for the bike type occurrence and another for the ride length and here we are defining how our uh, spark job is looking like so since we are using a spark operator we are creating a spark application we are defining a spark job name and yeah here here we are doing some configuration so since we are using Scala we here specify that our spark job is written in Scala it, con it also can be written in Java Python or R and uh, since uh, our driver pod and executor pod are inside Kubernetes we are using cluster uh, deployment mode and here we are specifying our uh, docker image our location of our jar inside container and our main class and yeah one another important thing is here we are specifying spark version so you can use 2.x or 3.x so it doesn't matter everything will work flawlessly and at the end we are defining the resource requirements so we are defining uh, CPU and memory usage and one specific thing for the driver uh, pod is that we need to specify service account so service account is a Kubernetes thing that allows us to authenticate with uh, Kubernetes API and allows us to bring up more pods so this service account has permissions to bring up more pods and this is important because here we are specifying how much executor instances we want to have so in this case we have two instances or two executor pods and yeah the second job is quite similar to the previous one the main difference is this one line so we are using different main class and yeah last but not least so since we are using DAG it is important to uh, let Argo know how our execution what our execution is doing and how it ended so here we are specifying the conditions on which our spark job or our spark, spark uh, task will fail or not so we are monitoring the actual spark job and now let me just go here so yeah this is the Argo workflow UI and now I'm going to submit a new workflow and yeah here you can see a graphical representation of our DAG you can see from here that is quite similar to the our YAML representation so everything is running now and just let me go here and list our pods so yeah you can see that both our driver pods are up and you can see that our executor pods are up and yeah let me list again so yeah you can see that the job is completed and now I'm going to show the logs for the bike type so here we are counting the occurrence of each bike type so you can he see here the result and I'm now going to show you the second job so here we are calculating the ride length for each bike type and yeah you can see here that our job is successful and yeah the last thing I want to show you uh, is how you can simplify your Argo workflow by using workflow templates so instead of writing uh, well this complicated manifest you can instead use a workflow template and make your life a lot easier so everything is quite similar to the previous example 
the important th thing here is we are simply referencing our workflow template and we are passing the parameters to our workflow template so you may notice that we are passing things like language that we are using uh, well how much resources we need and yeah now i'm going to show you how our workflow templates looks like so yeah here it is you may notice that this is quite similar to the one that i have show you and the important difference here is that we are using these parameters instead of actual values and yeah they are all specified here you can specify your default values and there is also different types of templating and yeah at the end uh, uh, this template is more general purpose purpose template that we use and your template can be a lot easier and s simpler so we are all we are here specifying almost everything and yeah that's about it for the uh, our demo yeah one quick point on the the workflow template is essentially that means that you have one person that would define the original template um, and they can then enable um, any other user who doesn't really know Argo well to just simply submit a, a workflow with the parameters that they want for their job, um, push that to Git and trigger a jo Argo workflows job off of the workflow template instead of having to write their own Argo workflows manifest. So that's something we see a lot is teams that um, implement Argo workflows and then can let other folks on the team who don't necessarily need to know the details um, start to run workflow jobs um, just based off of the parameters that we define. Okay, thanks. And yeah, let me just go back uh, to the presentation. So yeah, we saw how you can create a Spark job. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, we also saw how you can uh, use Argo workflows to execute your Spark job on Kubernetes and at the end we showed you how you can simplify your Argo workflow manifest by using a workflow template. So yeah, and the next steps, so well since we are already running Spark on Kubernetes, so you, by using Argo we can allow you to use cron workflows so you can run your workflows daily and you can execute uh, whatever you like on a daily basis or whatever basis you want you can also define a different node pools so you can use different type of instances for your for your machine learning for your gpu uh, well you can use the gpu node pools so then you can use uh, well node pools with different uh, hardware requirements and you can usually schedule your spark jobs there by using node affinity feature you can also uh, easily auto scale your cluster so your spark job can come up and based on the needs kubernetes can bring up more worker nodes execute the your spark job and downscale to one or zero and that way you can uh, lower your cost and last but not least you can extend your entire pipeline you can use GitOps and have everything in git and uh, you can also um, you can also trigger your uh, workflow by well by creating some kind of events so everything is possible so thank you yeah, and on the last point, um, here's a simple, or I guess a, an uh, architecture diagram of how you can build on top of this. So um, we already talked about running batch jobs, which is really the example we, we did before. Um, so you can have data that um, appears in a database, um, triggers an Argo workflows job, and runs uh, a job with Spark. Um, you can also then add in other data sources, so you can deploy an API um, that's streaming data through Kafka and can feed that into Spark or another streaming analytics um, tool that you'd like to use. Um, and again, orchestrate that job up depending on um, triggers that you set up in Argo. Um, and then since Argo is monitoring the state of all these jobs, um, it, can it can 
essentially trigger off any sort of machine learning job that you want to do. So you could trigger a training job, um, depending on like once the data has been processed, you can trigger that on the same cluster. And even once that's done, you can do a hyperparameter tuning check, or you can move on into model deployment and deploy the model to another API. And all of this can be on the same Kubernetes cluster, which makes things a bit easier to manage. Um, and if you wanted to then do you know, one cluster for dev or one cluster for prod, um, all this code is pretty reproducible. Um, so yeah, that wraps it up. A few extra resources. So once again, we have a repo. Um, so you can go check out all the code that we ran today. Um, in addition to that, we included a cron job that uses Python. So feel free to go check that out. Um, what's handy in there is, yeah, you can pull down the workflow template that um, we've parameterized, and you can start using that, for instance. Um, so that's really handy. We have a blog that covers more Argo Workflows topics and Spark topics. Um, and then a few other things to check out are if you're going to deploy Spark on Kubernetes, check out the Kubernetes operator GitHub repo, um, and check out the Argo Workflows docs for more details on how you can um, scale up resources. And that's it. Thanks. We'll be happy to take questions. Yeah, right in front. So I have a very basic question. Sure. Uh, so uh, you talked about templating, right? Mm -hmm. So in templating, how are you controlling those parameters? Like, uh, do you automatically have a dot .env or file which you are calling in the source code? Or like the users have the flexibility to add more parameters like within the template as well? Yeah, so the question is, how do we control the templating? How do you change the, the templates and parameters that are available to users? Um, how is it being made available to the source code? Like, like mm -hmm. How is it being made, made available to the source code? Cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So thanks. So yeah, basically, these parameters are available through environment variables. So you can easily define them, and you can easily use uh, workflow uh, manifest to add them, or you can ever even do that pro programmatically using Python SDK for Argo workflows. Yeah, right behind it. Uh, could you say uh, uh, what case of advanced users using Argo versus someone like Apache Airflow who can write full spoken um, uh, Spark on Kubernetes? Okay, cool. Yeah, good question. So the question was um, what's the advantage of using Argo workflows versus like an Airflow? Um, so we did have a quick couple points on that. Um, the biggest one is it's lighter weight to deploy Argo. Um, on Kubernetes and Airflow. So there's less dependencies to manage, um, less overhead from like a DevOps perspective. Um, you're also working completely container native with Argo workflows. So by default, every step runs as a container, which is you know just really handy when you're working with Kubernetes. Um, and then there's a lot of other features with Argo, um, like a lot of the dynamic and the parameter parameterization we talked about today is, is out of the box with Argo, whereas with, with um, Airflow, it's a bit harder, heavier of a lift to, to use. I think um, the biggest challenge is definitely like Python. Um, Argo Workflows is a YAML first approach, but now there's Python SDKs like this one called Hera Workflows that are essentially allowing you to declare your pipelines um, in Python and from like a functional perspective, which is handy. So if you've used Airflow or other um, Python-based orchestrators, a lot of the times you have to use decorators to define a lot of the, the pipeline. Um, and you actually don't have to do that now with Hera workflows and Argo workflows. So that's that's something where if you prefer more of a functional approach, um, it's definitely a, an advantage of using Argo workflows. Does that make sense? <laughs> okay. Thanks for the question. Yeah, over there. Yeah, the question is, yeah, since we're using the Spark Kubernetes operator, what's the value of also using Argo workflows on top? Yep. Um, so the big value there is now you can create um, larger DAGs, larger pipeline steps. So in, in addition to just using Spark, you can um, link up Spark with other tooling. So really, I guess the advantage is like since you're adopting an orchestrator um, to run your jobs, um, you can now orchestrate in, um, tooling around that initial Spark job. So that's probably the biggest advantage is like what you get beyond just the initial Spark deployment. Like, yeah, if you want to just deploy one Spark job, 
um, you could totally just use the Kubernetes operator and, and run that job. Um, if you want to then do a bit more like event-based triggering or um, if you want to link in like a Git ops approach, that's where Argo Workflows adds a lot of benefit. Um, and then I'd say, yeah, again, like more towards the right half of this um, diagram, like as you get more towards deployment, that's where Argo Workflows is essentially like a CI tool. Um, <laughs> a lot of people would describe it as that where, yeah, um, from there you can run a lot of tests and basically your whole CI suite out of Argo Workflows if you wanted. So um, yeah, at the end of the day, um, it's not like the simplest out of the gate, but then it, um, it provides much more options going forward. Yes, another question? <clears throat> yeah, question is how does um, Argo workflows talk to the Kubernetes master and the API? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. So basically, Argo is implementing uh, well the entire in, entire Kubernetes API, and by using service accounts and all the permissions that are available there, Argo is able to well to bring up entire workflow. It's able to monitor everything, and at the end, it's able able to destroy everything when it's no longer needed. Yeah, yeah. So it's uh, inside cluster. You have like uh, well, entire yes, yeah. yeah. Oh, sorry. So yeah, inside the cluster you have uh, Argo controller and uh, workflow con workflow controller. So these two services are controlling everything regarding Argo. Yeah, and that'll be so you'll do um, deploy Argo into like an Argo namespace, and then yeah, as Darko mentioned, um, it has the the resource definition for Kubernetes to be able to talk to the API. So that's like a big advantage of using Argo is just all of that is very straightforward compared to like an Airflow um, where there's there's more dependencies and um, it isn't just built for um, being Kubernetes native. Any other questions? Yeah, one more question up front. Yeah, yeah, a couple Okay. Okay, yeah, as the first question, I'll try to summarize. So you're saying, yeah, in the past, um, like, I guess you're assessing using Airflow and Argo workflows, one of the two on Kubernetes, and you've ran into some issues with, like, the overhead of Airflow on Kubernetes, but then you're still looking to understand what is the development lifecycle with Argo workflows on Kubernetes. Yeah, um, and, and specifically, is the UI, the Argo workflows UI, where everybody's interacting? Um, so yeah, as far as like the development lifecycle goes, um, it's you can deploy Argo locally, which is really handy, um, and that deployment will be pretty much the same as what you're going to be deploying to AWS or Google or Azure. And um, the big variance is then just how granular do you want to get in your roles and, and like your RBAC control um, and your security parameters. But for the most part, um, that deployment's quite straightforward. And then once you're running workflows, all of the workflows, yeah, will appear in the Argo UI. Um, so if anyone is not as familiar with like YAML or the Kubernetes side of things, they can access workflows there. Um, and and you, would, you would make that available to a URL that they could access. And then they could see the logs, um, all the workflows that have ran. You can set up workflow archiving um, so you can save the workflows once they're done. Um, and that's, yeah, primarily the place where 
folks who aren't um, as Kubernetes oriented would go. Um, the other option is, you know, running it out of a Git repo. So if once people are very familiar with like the, the workflow definitions, either in YAML or in Python, um, like we talked about earlier, um, you can essentially set up Git ops triggers to basically use the repo as the source of truth instead of like the UI. Um, so on any sort of pull request um, or merge, you could then trigger workflows. Um, but yeah, you end up going back to either the UI or you go back to the uh, kubectl to view the status of the workflows that you're running. Argo CLI. Yeah, oh yeah, sorry, the Argo CLI as well, yeah. <laughs> Does that answer your question as far as that goes? And yeah, I think we could happy to talk about more about like larger deployments. Cool. All right. Thanks a lot for coming, everybody. Have a great day. <laughs>